stickered all over our body on the clothes that hug us and in this moment I would urge you stop don't do it 
there's that temptation to, when I've said what I've just said, you're thinking of someone. Think of yourself. Because when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about, I have an aunt. And <laughs> in the family, we call this aunt Mrs. Bouquet. You remember that program, um, Keeping Up With Appearances? Yes. You know, Mrs. Bucket, what she likes, to, you know, Mrs. Bouquet. And it's just this kind of this pompous, you know, peacocking of material possessions and wealth and all this kind of stuff. And I say that because it's too easy to overlook our own frailties and focus on someone else's. But in this moment, as I, as, as I deliver what I will, just think about yourself. Think about your own frailties, because we are in the world, but we're not of it. And yet we are exposed to its influences and its daily desires to mold us into a certain form, into a certain fashion that reflects the world and not Christ. And so with that being said, I want to look at a variety of passages concerning the warnings of the potential dangers of having an obsession with our possessions. And so the title of the message is Contentment, the Cure to an Obsession of Possessions. So if we turn to Luke chapter 12, we'll be reading from verse 13 to 21. And it reads as follows. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And we'll pause it there. In uh, Deuteronomy 21, 17, the rule for inheritance is given. And in cases where there were disputes about an inheritance, uh, at this time that Jesus was speaking, the tendency, uh, the common practice was to go to a rabbi to settle the dispute. And yet here we have this man calling out to Jesus, basically asking him to rule in his favor. Saying, tell my brother to split the inheritance. I notice it doesn't say split our inheritance or my inheritance, it just says the inheritance. So some speculation here, but it may not have even been his own inheritance. It could have been his brother's and he has this desire to have it because he wants to get something. It's the reason Jesus responds in the way he does. Who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Because he could see what this man truly wanted. And then from there we have this double warning from Jesus about possessions. We are to take care and to guard against all covetousness. Covetousness being an excessive desire of wealth or possessions. Or according to the great theolio, theolio, theo, whoop, sorry, what? theologian, which is my mother, it means being too red-eye. <laughs> Covetousness is something that can manifest in different ways. But the root cause of this sin is a lack of contentment. It com comes from a place of deep-seated dissatisfaction. Covetousness and contentment are basically diametrically opposed. They are north and south, they are water and oil. But Jesus says that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. In other words, there is more to life than possessions. Life consists of more than the clothes that you can buy or wear. Life consists of more than the car that you drive, more than the house that you own. 
But unfortunately, there are many who are riddled with debt and shackled with depression and drowning in covetousness because their life consists only of their possession. But Jesus says, there is more. And then we have the parable itself, this man with his barns. And what is striking to me is that in this parable, this man already has plenty. He already has plenty. They're already full. And yet his desire is to tear them down and have bigger ones. He wants bigger ones. Isn't it interesting that from the seat of discontentment, you can find, you know, it can be found in the desire to pursue for more. So you have, but you want more. You don't need more, you already have plenty. Not he had an okay, but he had plenty. But he wanted more. In verse 20, Jesus says, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus tells the crowd that it is foolish to live this way. And it's foolish, brother, because all your possessions that you amass, you can't, they can't be traded in for some kind of heavenly currency. We can't take these things with us. When our soul is required of us, they remain. You may have heard in the news this morning, uh, the chairman or the owner of Leicester City, he left the King Power Stadium in a helicopter with his relatives and the helicopter malfunctioned and crashed into a ball of fire outside the stadium. All his wealth, when his soul is required of him, it will remain. All of these possessions, amassing these possessions, and for what? Mark 8, verse 36 to 37 says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Do you see the weighty value that is placed on the soul? The whole world and all of its content, all that it has to offer does not compare to the price of a soul. And yet there are those who would trade their soul for the obsession of their possessions, thinking that an external fix will heal their internal discontented disposition. Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan, puts it like this. He says, to be content by some external thing is like warming a man's clothes by the fire. But to be content through an inward disposition of the soul is like warmth that a man's clothes have from his natural body. You see the difference? Yes. One is a quick temporal fix, but one internal. I have mentioned the word contentment quite a bit without actually defining what it is. Again, I go back to Jeremiah Burroughs and he describes it like this. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. And I read that, I kind of thought, this kind of sounds like Paul in Philippians 4, where he accounts that he knows he can be content in whatever situation he is in. He can be content if he's brought low, if he's abound. He can find contentment. He understands what the secret of contentment yes. is. Yes. I pray that the Lord will make that a reality in our lives, that we can have that contentment that Paul speaks of. Anyway, going back, Jesus told the crowd to take care and guard against covetousness. We must take care, we must be aware, be on the lookout for covetousness in our lives. And beloved, we must be on guard because it's possible that we can be discontent but masquerade as being content. You want to know what that looks like? It sounds like I would love, I, I love God because he's going to give me this stuff. I love God because he's going to give me X, Y, Z. It's this kind of transactional gospel, this prosperity gospel. It's nonsense, it's garbage. And it, it's this attempting to use God for gain 
of possessions, using God to get stuff. It's the hallmarks of a prosperity gospel, the emphasis on the material possessions rather than the spiritual progression. You've seen the, the, the tele-evangelists. Send in your seed and God will bless you 100 fold. You know? It's like God is some heavenly labrux or paddy power where you can just insert and then God will give you, you know, if you hedge your bets, right? Charlatans, that's what they are. But it can breed this kind of twisted association we have sometimes where we equate blessings merely as material possessions. Seeing possessions as superior to the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Chief of those, the redemption of our souls by the blood. Taking us away from God's wrath. That is the chief blessing. No possession you can have can outweigh that. Nothing you can buy, nothing you can gain. Nothing that can be given can outweigh the depth of the gracious gift of Jesus Christ. You know, the craziest thing is it's free. Free. Let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy 6. We'll be going from verse 3, but prior to this chapter, Paul has already mentioned the false teachers in his letter to Timothy mentioning their speculations on the law and their denial of creation. Now he categorizes them as deviating from sound doctrine, dividing the church and being motivated by greed. Let's read. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we, can take, we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. <coughs> For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Now, it isn't explicitly told to us how the false teachers were exploiting godliness for gain. But we do know that it was happening. And it's not only in Timothy that we see this. But Paul goes on to let us know that people were wandering from the faith, piercing themselves with many pangs. There is this emphasis that we can't take our earthly goods with us again. We can't take our possessions with us. We didn't enter the world with them and we will not leave with them. In verse 11, we see the things that Paul instructs Timothy, Timothy to pursue. So instead of pursuing possessions and wealth and all these things, this is what he tells Timothy to pursue. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Let's have an obsession with these things. Let's desire to have these things. You know, I remember having a conversation with a, a brother of mine called Othnil. He went to a Baptist church and he was telling me of a former church that he went to and he was saying, you know, if you wanted them to pray, for like, you know, um, I'm struggling with this sin, or I need to be more patient, can you help me? They'll pray for you, fine, gladly. He said, but if you ask them to pray for money, he said they would be sweating, praying so hard for this money, praying for this wealth. He said that the intensity of their prayer was like, you know, if we don't pray this prayer, this person's gonna die, you know, but it was about money. Imagine a room of big men sweating, praying about money. <laughs> Verse um, 
So yeah, verse 18, Paul instructs uh, rich to be rich in good works, to be generous, and that doing so is laying up treasure in heaven. In doing this, in being generous, being rich in good works, being ready to share, they are taking hold of what is truly life. And just ask yourself, am I storing up treasures in heaven or am I storing up treasures on earth? Well, which one am I doing? And you know, there's another word for this obsession with possessions. This is called idolatry. Luke 18, Jesus again is speaking to a crowd. I'm going from verse 18. <laughs> and it says, And a ruler asked him, this is Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'll just stop there. That good teacher at the time that it was used was actually, uh, like, it's not the proper way that you would speak to a rabbi. It was uh, a term of flattery, trying to get you know, this connection with Jesus. So he's flattering him. It's why Jesus responds in this way. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Only your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all, your, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me verse 23 but when he heard these things he became very sad sorrowful stricken with grief for he was extremely rich he was extremely rich if you notice there when he's asking about eternal life Jesus mentions the horizontal aspects of the commandments, those that which relate to your fellow male and female, your man and your woman, humanity. And this young man says, I've done these things from my youth. It's almost like this, this moralism. You know, moralism and Christianity are two very different things. This man says, I've done all those things that you say. I've done that from from early, as the young people would say. I've done that from early. However, when Jesus speaks of his possessions, it kind of pierces through all of that moralism, and then we find the heart of the matter. This rich man became very sad. His obsession with his possessions, just like the saber-toothed squirrel, <laughs> his, his wealth, his stuff, was so great. The hold, on it, the hold on him was so great that he became sad because he knew he could not forsake those things for Jesus. The man was filled with grief because he had been doing the complete opposite to what Christ says in Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. <coughs> for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This man's heart was held captive by the idolatry of his riches, the idolatry of his possessions. And so the treasure of his heart were those things. Ask yourself, what is the treasure of my heart? Is it truly Christ? Do I really have contentment in Christ or is it masquerading? Is it something else? Am I just here to get something? Now, some people are going around collecting all this stuff, all these possessions, filling every pocket, backpack, truck, boot, everything. So much so that when Christ comes and extends his hand, they can't extend it because their hands are full of stuff. <laughs> hands are full of stuff full of possessions so when Christ says come unto me they can't the stuff too much stuff too many bags too many things in pockets incapable of grabbing hold to the true treasure which is Christ and when the gospel 
interacts with us, when it rises us from death to life, like the valley of dry bones, when the gospel turns our stony hearts into a heart of flesh, we have to turn away from idols. No longer are we to worship the creation, but the creator. And when this happens, we can truly sing, I would rather have Jesus than silver or gold. So I urge you, possess God, not what God gives. Seek his face and not his hand. And let us be generous with all that we have, remembering that it is better to give than to receive. But we are here for a short while. Let's not get caught up with these possessions for vanity or temporal satisfaction. But what we have, freely give. Richly give to those in need. From the abundance of what God has blessed you with, give. Just like our Father gave. In Romans 8 verse 32 it says, He, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. This is the, the, the greatest giving of possession that you can see. That the Father would give his only begotten Son. I leave you with uh, one final thought from Jeremiah Burroughs. He says, my brethren, the reason why you do not have contentment in the things of the world is not that you do not have enough of them. The reason is that they are not things proportional to that immortal soul of yours that is capable of God himself. Stand with me, let me just quickly pray. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And who are we that you should be mindful of us, Lord? That you would graciously shower us with your blessings. That you would graciously look upon us with mercy. Knowing that we deserved wrath, but you gave us the greatest possession. The, the, the treasure that is Christ Jesus. Without which we would be standing in the firing line of your wrath. But Lord, we thank you that you have turned our affections away from idolatry, that you have turned our affections away from our possessions. Lord, help us to, to you know, we, we're so quick to wander, so quick to leave you for, for things, for possessions, for people. But Lord, turn our hearts' affections to you. Let our eyes be fixed on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us of those moments when we forsake you. When we forsake you for possessions, when we forsake you for goods, when we forsake you for wealth. And this we ask, Lord, in no other name but the strong name of, the, of Jesus the Christ. And the whole church says, Amen. Amen.